I'm all about the good vibes, the good vibes. We bout to have a good time, a good time. Leave my problems all behind, all behind. We living out the good life, the good life, yeah. I ain't gotta worry about a thing. Oh no. Had some obstacles I overcame. Oh yeah. You don't have to ever be the same. Oh no. Cause when we change the mind, we change the game. Yo, 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 what's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Kenny Clutch, with another episode on the Clutch Vision Podcast. I got another very special guest in the building tonight, all the way from Jersey, my man, 50 grand, Mr. Jason Johnson. They call him the in-home parent coach, and he is also the founder of Fathers Leading Families. What's going on, big boy? How's it going, Mr. Kenny Clutch? Thank you so much for having me. Oh, man, I appreciate you making the time out to come on the show and everything. How's everything on your end of the world, your spectrum, even though you're only like maybe an hour and a half away from me? You know, how, how's everything on the other side of Jersey going? Other side of Jersey is um, pretty much the same down there. I mean, it was raining today, yeah. uh, but we still that, that stay at home order has officially, you know, been lifted across the state. So we're all just kind of figure out, you know, what steps are as, uh, the majority of what I do has been mostly remote, so. Right, right, right. Yeah, so so let's get into it, man. You know, they, they, they call you the in-home parent coach, which I've never really heard of before until, you know, we stumbled upon each other. So explain to the, to the audience, you know, what exactly is the in-home parent coach? How did you begin this? You know, what was the inspiration behind it? Sure, absolutely. Well, so the in-home parent coach really developed – um, kind of something I kind of fell into. Um, it became like almost like a Superman cape um, that, you know, when I had first started out, I was just, let's take it back to like early 20s and, and as a teenager, I was really good, always good with kids mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, helping them to laugh and have fun and, you know, things like that. Um, I was never good at like, okay, sit down and then they'll listen or, you know, um, you know, correcting their behavior. I was just fun as hell, love to play games, smile, laughter. Um, but I really did not know how to get kids to listen. Um, so I originally went to school for art, you know, painting, drawing, sculpting, things like that. And when I was 19, I had a, a transformational summer in Ocean City, Maryland, and I read a book. And by the time I was done reading that book, um, how to get what you want and want what you have mm-hmm. by um, the same guy who wrote men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Okay. He had a second, he had a different book. So I finished that book and I was like, wow, mm-hmm. um, I want to help people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew at 19, I had found my purpose. Mm-hmm. I didn't know right. where it was going to go. I didn't know what it was going to look like. Mm-hmm. But after that summer, I went back to school halfway through my fine arts career. Yeah. I went changed it to psychology and I was like, you know what? This is, my, this is a life mission. Just light bulb moment and ran with it. Mm-hmm. So when I finished, so I went back. You know, they don't tell you you can't really finish your college degree in, uh, in, in actually four years. That's what they claim. You could do it in four years. Yeah. But I had gone back to school halfway through the career, made up all the courses, and I was able to do it in four years and a semester. Mm-hmm. Mind you, at the same time, I was living with mom and uncle uh, because when I was young, my parents died. Mm -hmm. So I had been living with them since I was seven years old. So I'm in the middle of college. Mm -hmm. I actually move out of the house. And basically from there, it was how I fell into it because I'm living on my own. I'm working two or three jobs. I'm putting myself through school. And I started working in jobs with with kids like after school programs. I started working in jobs where they call me Mr. Jason and, you know, uh, uh, programs with children with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, a shining star program. So I was getting hired for different babysitting jobs and I I would just cycle as many jobs as I could delivering pizza, um, working with kids, just anything that I could do. I was working a lot. So long story short, I was actually not good at getting the children to listen. Mm. 
So for the first like two or three major jobs working with kids, I guess they thought because I'm a guy, I'm a little bit bigger, that I would just have some magical powers, sprinkle some fairy dust, and kids would just listen to me. Right, but right. I was like, you know, I was like Mr. Fun Guy. So I would have like all these kids running up to me, climbing on my leg. I'm like, you got to sit down. You know, I was like a disruption to whatever was going on. Mm. So I say this on purpose because for my, the majority of the beginning of my career, I didn't know how to get kids to listen, mm. to provide structure. Mm. So um, what happened was after I, I graduated, I got a job in basically a hospital for three to six year olds. It, it was so groundbreaking, like literally it was a, a, a partial hospitalizational program for preschoolers. Um, kids would either get kicked out of school because of their behavior. Um, I'm talking about like you tell them to sit down and they're like, F you, get naked, throw their feces on the walls, right. fights every day. And there was only like six Who's kids in the room. Who's in the hood? <laughs> six kids. And, that, and that's the thing. It was the, it partially... The, the program was in different locations. Mm -hmm. Two of them happened to be in the hood and one of them wasn't. It was in like in a suburban area. But what all the locations had in common was that they would bust the kids there. Mm -hmm. So Medicaid paid for it. There was a psychiatrist on staff to monitor the kids if they needed medication. There were, there were therapists there who would pull them out during the day and give them therapy. And that's where I started to, some fun, interesting things started to happen. When I first got there, I wasn't really good, but I really played, paid close attention because the job had a lot of turnover rate. People were coming and going every couple of weeks. Uh, it was like a stepping stone job for most people. Right. So as I watched what was in front of me, I kind of learned, okay, I'm definitely not going to do this. That was like my first six months in the program, mm -hmm. working with these kids. Okay, this caused a fight. I'm just, I don't know what to do, but I'm not going to do that because – these kids were like some kids can throw down. We actually yeah. had to learn restraint techniques. We were allowed to restrain these kids. Mm. So in the beginning, I went through the protocol, learned the restraint techniques, uh, you know, tried my best to, to fit in in the place. But, you know, I was just really serious for some weird reason. Yeah. I took it very seriously. Yeah. I took it like an experiment, like a scientific experiment. Like yeah. I'm going to figure like, out like, it seems like to me like you were put in that position to kind of like learn and work out the kinks before you actually took off. That Absolutely. Accurate. Yeah. It's, these kids taught me everything I know. Mm -hmm. There's about 50 to 75 kids in total over the two and a half years that I was there. Right. Um, but if I were to, for about five hours a day, um, five and a half hours a day for five days a week, I took this like, like I was honing my craft. Like I know you dance and you know, you practice every move and you just again and do it again and again until you perfect it. Right. I took this and nobody asked me to, I just took it upon myself. I'm like, no, like this is really serious to me. So I learned how to get kids to listen without the restraints. Right. I could be 10 feet away from kids. What I would say would be powerful enough to get them to listen. And it was kind of a weird experience because we'd have therapists who would come in. The kids wouldn't listen to the therapist. Mm. And I didn't go back to school at that time. So all I knew is a therapist came, took the kid to another room. It usually lasted about 10 minutes or so because the kid would destroy something or hit the therapist or pull the therapist's hair and they have to come back to the room and they have to end the session. Right. And it was crazy because I would just say, okay, it's time to go. And they would go, or it's time to sit down, come sit down. Right. But that took a very, very long time. Mm. So the in-home parent coach, I yeah. fell into this because I thought I was just really good with kids. Mm. Like not just getting them to have fun, but now I learned how to get them to listen. Mm. And there's literally like a science behind it. Okay. So when I went back to school I, for my graduate degree, I learned all the counseling techniques for little kids. Mm. Now, mind you, there are okay counseling techniques out there for adults for teenagers, but for very, very young kids, our field, I have to be honest, is clueless. Yeah. How to get kids to listen. Yeah. So um, being a home parent coach, I fell into it because I was so good at getting kids to listen mm. that when I got my license and started practicing family therapy in an office, right. I got tired of hearing, 
My kid won't go to bed at 8.30. Mm -hmm. uh, he stays up to nine, like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, my child won't eat dinner. They throw the food and then they don't listen. Yeah. Siblings are constantly fighting. I don't know what to do. Right. I didn't want to listen in the, audio, in the office anymore. I just, I didn't want to listen. I was like, can I just go to your house and, and mm -hmm. show you how to do this? Mm. So luckily I worked for an agency that gave me the freedom to kind of run my own program in the safety of that agency. Right. And that's how the in-home parent coach came about. Wow. That's dope, man. That's dope. I get it though. You know, it's like you, you get tired of listening to the same thing over and over and over again. And then you just want to go ahead and just do something about it. Right. I mean, Absolutely. Isn't that like the human way anyway? Like you get tired of seeing something, you see a problem and then you actually go fix the actual problem, you know? Like so many people today, I feel like, okay, like there's so much going on in the world and people see a problem and then they don't want to do nothing about the problem. Here, we have a case of, you know, there are parents that are, you know, going through so many different things with their children and they're not listening, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. And then here you come, to come in and solving this problem. Now, my question, my next question is like, you know, how, uh, what is, what's the age range that you, that you go from? Like, is it, you know, from babies to, you know, teenagers, like what's the age range normally, or do you have like a cutoff point? So there, there's what I can do and what I like to do. So, um, as soon as they're about 15, 12, uh, 13 to 15 months old, um, there's all sorts of nonverbal ways to communicate with kids. You don't have to have a conversation. Um, but these three to six year olds taught me that taught me that it doesn't just work for three to six year olds. Mm -hmm. It works for three to 12 year olds. And if I change, if I don't talk to teenagers, like I talk to three year olds, I can use the same principles and the same modality. Right. And it worked. It works as long as a child is living under a parent's roof because what I had tapped into is what I, I think I'm the expert in the leader follower dynamic. Yeah. So there are a couple relationships that have that okay. parent, child, leader, follower, teacher, student, leader, follower, mm -hmm. employer, employee, leader, follower. Now, right. because I think my life history and losing parents at a young age, I value the most yeah. the parent child connection. Yeah. And that's why I'm not the in school teacher counselor. You know, mm -hmm. I don't I could go to schools and teach teachers right. how to do some of these things, but these principles only the parents have the authority to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the ego to be like, oh, I could just get people to listen to me. I was like, how much more special would it be for that parent child connection if the parent could take what's in my brain mm -hmm. and have it and do it themselves? and then have the connection with their child right. instead of me going in there and stimulating something that what really matters at the end of the day is that parent-child relationship. Mm, right. So what I did is kind of like what Caesar Milan does with dogs. Yeah. You know, he's, he's not afraid of dogs. He's right. a dog whisperer. Yeah, he like what he does is a funny thing. Yeah. He goes to people's houses. He tells the dog, not only are you going to listen to me as the trainer, while your owners don't know what they're doing just yet, but you're going to listen to me, dog, and you're also going to listen to me as I instruct your owner to, to prop you up as the leader of your home so that you're now going to start listening to your owner, and then I'm going to wean myself out, and then you're going to have your relationship, and it's going to be a true leader-follower dynamic. Wow. I am afraid of dogs, right. so I can't do it with animals. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of children and teens. Right, right. I, do it with, I do it with families. Absolutely. So, so how long is a normal session like, and, and what's the result rate, you know, wait, like, you know, do you get any, do you get feedback in terms of you have to go back to someone's house after you have done the session with them already? Like if they've completed their particular session or, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, so what's right. the, the rate uh, so of success? Over, like? over the years, I developed it to a 12 week curriculum. It's just the right amount of time where I can go in and not disturb the real relationship between parent and child mm -hmm. and not become, have more authority than the actual parent. It's just enough time to get their attention, to, to prop up the parent. So first I do it for them. 
So one thing, you know, we, we hear about like um, Super Nanny, you know, Super Nanny was this big time show. Right. It, it proved that millions of people needed home, like help in their home, but I actually don't do the same techniques at all. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have in common is it takes place in their house. But right. my model is I do it for you first. You can't get your kid to, to bed at 8.30, I'm there. Well, as long as they're 10 and under, you know, I'm there. We got about a decade to figure out feeding and sleeping. But right. uh, um, I'm there at your home showing you how to do it. And I do it first, right. just so you know what's possible, just mm. so you know it can be done. Mm. Mm. Then within two or three meetings, I'm doing it with the parent, wow. telling them what to say, what not to say, move back, go forward. Okay, kind of help them move. Okay, now just leave that alone, mm -hmm. live. Right. Um, and then the third phase is I'm 10 feet away and I'm not really instructing because they already got the skills to do it themselves. Right, so it's pretty much you're kind of like training the parents on what to do and how to, you know, uh, teach the talk to their kids so that the kids end up listening to them for the long Correct. Wow. I want to get in and out because... You know, nobody else can prove this, yeah. but I know in some levels I'm messing in an area that I don't belong. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the type of leadership that I'm teaching, mm -hmm. it's, it's you get in and you get out and you leave a skill with the parents. Mm -hmm. You stay in too long, you overthrow the authority. Yeah, yeah. I and that's not the goal. I, I, right. I, my, my, my father died when I was six. My mm -hmm. mother died when I was seven. My, my first death was my brother dying when I was a year and a half old. Wow. So if anybody has a, oh, he's on a power trip, they could go ahead with that. Because what I know is what people say cl cliche things about, you know, value your time with your family. You know, uh, make sure that you, you're, you're connected and fa only, only family matters. So the thing is, all human beings have a loyalty to their own family. Now, the only difference is, I didn't have that immediate family, but I still have an overflow to give. So like, for example, most, most people are like, okay, uh, my mother needs help with this. I got to go take her to the airport. Right. Oh, my brother needs help with this. So I'm going to go take care of their kids. I like everybody else still have displaced flow of energy to give. Wow. wow. It didn't, it doesn't go away just because I don't have an immediate family. Right. right. Um, but what I, so, so that, so how, like for for a child that has lost, you know, their both of their parents at six and seven years old, you know, you know, I, what what is going through your mind at that at that age? Do you understand? Do you and then how do you how did you move forward um, from them to to be who you are now? Like, what was the steps that you took, you know, after losing your mother and your father? I think it was a combination of things that I had control over and things that I had no control over. Some of it was like my personality and my temperament um, and just who I am in the world. And some of it was something looking out for me. So, um, you know, all these things happen at times where I hadn't mastered English. You know, when you're six, seven, when you're a year and a half, um, clearly when my brother died, I was pre-verbal, you know, six years old. Yeah, you have language, you can talk, but you don't understand the bigger picture in the world um so it happened at a time where um you know they claim that th the brain develops by eight by eight and then you're done so if that were true i would have been screwed <laughs> so uh, yeah let's, well let's, let's, the brain not, develops at, at, at i've seen the study that a brain now develops at uh fully developed at 25 correct i yeah. push it to 30 but yes <laughs> All the, right. the brain the brain takes it as as humans the brain takes incredibly long to develop yes. yes so what i have an understanding of is kind of the developmental stages because prior to my parents dying i was running the household mm -hmm. so i had two half brothers i was changing diapers i was cooking for a dying mother that i didn't know was dying wow. i was being you know kept home from school my father wasn't around um when he was in he was in and out so um so I was what they call parentified child, which is basically a grown up raising kids, taking care of my mother, ironing clothes, cooking meals. Like I would never let <laughs> a six or seven year old do these type of things. But it's, it, I mean, I learned that so, at five as well, too. There you go. There you go. 
But you know, um, my situation was different. So you know, but it was just more of a preparation thing. My my family, my mom and dad ended up having to work halfway across the country when I was mm-hmm. 10, I was seventeen. So that the training that I received when I was five, six, seven years old kind of like came in handy when I was ten. But but gotcha. yeah, but continue. No, no, absolutely. I, yeah. The thing is that you know, um, loss and death affect people differently. So there's no like right way. You know what I mean? To grieve and, and to look at loss. Um, so um, I work with many kids, for example, their parents are alive, but they're not connected. Mm-hmm. So I don't find myself trapped like, oh, you should feel so lucky because you have your parents. Right. You know, I have a healthy understanding of what happened in my life and how it happened to me. And that it's not, a t- this is not like, I can't find uh, statistical evidence about this, but right. Through my life, I've learned that most people have one parent figure till about 30. They may not have both, but in general, and again, this is a lot of growing up and saying, just do conversation. Hey, um, I'm 10. You lost your parents yet? No. Okay. I'm 15. You lost your parents yet? Well, I might've lost my dad or or I might've lost my mom. Okay. I'm 24 in college. Still got a parent. I'm 30. I only came across one other person who lost both their parents by 24. Mm. Both parents died and not, and and now people who are adopted have a different story that is not comparable. So somebody might hear and say, well, I have my parents because I I didn't know my parents. Um, Everything has pluses and minuses. Like I had the the, the trauma of losing my, my parents, but even though I was young, I knew them. I remember them. I have stories. I can tell you about them. Right. Where like, as an adopted person may not have that frame of reference. So yeah. everybody has different challenges. Yeah. But what my journey gave me was the ability to basically life, God, whatever you want to call it. Here was the exchange. Yeah. You're going to lose both your parents. Yeah. But in exchange, you're going to learn how to parent everybody. Mm. That was the exchange. Yeah. And I think my personality can handle it. You know, um, I, I don't get angry very easily. Right. Right. I don't get overly despair very, like I'm just kind of even killed. I don't get enraged and I don't get into despair. Um, my running theory about myself is early on, God snipped that connector of you get enraged, it's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. If you get overly despaired, you're not going to be able to handle your life. So when I say some of it was in my control, my own natural temperament is calm even keeled, yeah. uh, curious. I want to learn. I want to help. That's just kind of yeah. how I came into Definitely. the world. Yeah. And then I feel like I was, I was kind of chosen or or led in a direction to say yeah. we're going to use these gifts and talents to help yeah. people who need it, Definitely. which was not in my control. Right. Because I didn't set out to be the in-home parent coach. Right. I set out to help kids help young kids express themselves and feel heard and get them to listen. And I got really good at it. I got so good that I was like, you know what? It's better for parents to have this information than me. And I've dedicated my life to give that information instead of just like talking crap or, you know, or, or just keeping it all to myself, like hoarding all the information. Right. So, so let me ask you this. So how does someone even get in contact with the in-home parent coach if they're ha- having an issue? Uh, yeah, sure. It's, it's uh, website's the best way, www.theinhomeparentcoach.com. Right. Um, it goes through all the different services that we provide from in-home therapy to in-home parent coaching, which is, there's a difference. Coaching maximizes skills. So like if you, you like you can jump a certain height, right? In basketball. Right. You want to go to a jumping coach to help you jump higher. So parent coaching is you're already whole. You're not broken. Nothing's wrong with you. Yes, you have challenges, but we're not fixing anything. You you have a certain level of skill, and we're going to raise that level of skill to to help you um, connect better, to basically direct better, to follow through better, and to listen better to your child. Those are the three skills that will be enhanced through parent coaching. Right. Now there's therapy, which we offer, which is therapy is the same as like basically the medical medical field. You have yeah. a broken bone that like you were living your life. You were cool. You broke your leg. 
So now you need treat, you need a diagnosis right. and you need right. a treatment to right. bring you back up to where you were, not get you to jump higher, not get you to be stronger, to get, just get you back to zero. Yeah. So I don't particularly, I've been trained in the therapy model through schooling, but I don't love the medical model because it means you're broken and that we have to return you to zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas with coaching, you're whole and you might be doing something at a one or two or three, but we get you seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 100. Right. So how so many- I identify as a parent coach. Right. So, so let me ask you this. So how many clients are you guys actually serving now? So part of what we do, so over the years, um, we've served at least 500 to 1,000 families in various programs. Wow. You know, all of it is not in-home parent coaching. Right. Um, we have also partnered with New Jersey to provide in-home therapy um, for, for children with depression, teenagers with depression, um, uh, children with autism, um, intellectually disabled. Um, so a lot of what we do currently is uh, working with um, – moderate to severe uh, children with autism. Some are nonverbal. And ironically, all my skills from parent coaching, learning what to say, what not to say, is what helped me be qualified yeah. to work with the population in the first place. Right. So that's I can work with them as young as 12 months, 15 months. Mm. That's, pre, that's pre-verbal. Right. So there are conversations that are going on. We might not be talking in language, but... Um, so, but, but yeah, we've, we've worked with many families throughout the years. I've personally been in over, I stopped counting after 200 homes. Uh, there you I go. Stopped. There you go. There you I go. Hold up. All right, all right, all right. Hold up now. <laughs> Hold up now. And, I, and I'm talking about in their home during bedtime, get, yeah. helping them get their kids to bed in their home during dinner time getting their routine done in eight to 12 minutes, everybody's eating, everybody's they're setting the table, they're eating, they're cleaning up after themselves, and then they're going on with their night. I think about it like this. I think that like a lot of times we have children that are so familiar with their parents that they then don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I see that that may be some case, not all, but in some cases, they're so familiar. It's like when you're familiar with something, Sometimes you just need a fresh voice or a familiar voice, you know, mm, you know, nice. me, you know, me like, you know, from a faith standpoint, you know, it's just, um, you know, Jesus said, I, I, you know, you can't be a prophet, you know, in your own home and basically saying that sometimes or whatever, you're not going to be able to like, even me as a motivational speaker, it may not work. Uh, my methods may not work with my children because they're so familiar with me, but if I go out to a different city or a different organization, you know, the methods that I, that I preach about may work with them because they're not familiar with my voice as much as, you know, my family may be, even though my family listens to me or whatever, yeah, but I'm just using it, them as an example that there may be times where, you know, my methods may not work as, as much as it would work with uh, Sally Mae from, you know, Oregon. You know so what I'm I, so I love I love this topic because I have a really great um, way of looking at it. Okay. So over the years, um, you know, I've also been a stepdad. I'm not currently a stepdad, but in the past, I helped raise two boys who are not my biological children. Right. Um, and um, you know, I do have a daughter now. Yeah. So and there are homes that I go to. So I got everything from a professional level to a close but not my child experience and to actual child experience, biological child. And what I've learned is that leadership skills are just different. Leadership skills are like gravity. Yeah. It's nothing, I'm not prophesizing anything. Yeah. It's like if I'm on the second story of a building and I jump off, then I know I'm not going up. Yeah. The thing is that education-wise, this, this is not, we don't know just yet that getting kids to listen is a science. Mm. We're, you know, there was a time when we believed the earth was the center of the solar system and everything traveled around the earth. And there were some statisticians and, or, or, or astro, 
whatever people have yeah, said, yeah. you know, by my mathematical calculations, I think there's this thing called the sun in the middle of the earth and I mean of the, of the universe and we travel around the sun and they were like, uh, kill that guy. So we're just, we don't know it yet. And I value my life. So I only share it kind of in a yeah. mentoring I take people under my wing that want to know about it. I don't like spreading out too loud because I don't want to. I don't want to make waves. But we will learn in time that leadership is like uh, like gravity, and there are it, it is there are universal principles that it's not my personality. Um, it's not anything really due to me as long as I understand the principles. Yeah. Then they work. It's just a matter of learning the principles yeah. with the with the caveat. Mm -hmm. that the closer a child is to the person, mm -hmm. it's harder for a different reason. Not because it's a familiar voice. Right. Not, it's because usually the things that you allow yourself to get away with, your mm -hmm. children automatically get a pass. Mm -hmm. And also to make things a little bit, parenting right now is very, very simple in the sense that the model is this. I do exactly what was done to me because it's all that I know. I do the exact opposite of what was done to me because it sucked and I hated it. Wow. That is the parenting compass right now. Right. I did it. I do it because it was done to me and I didn't turn out so bad. So I'm using it or it sucked. I didn't like it. So I'm never doing that crap in my life. Mm. That is the guiding compass. So people are doing the best that they know how to do. And it's a really weird setup because children have no such formula in their head. They're just like, I want what I want and I want it now. Mm. That's the child formula. The parent formula is I want better for my child than I had for myself. Right. So there's a natural conflict living in 2020. Actually, there's been a natural conflict since we've all needed cell phones, like after 2001. Yeah. We've reached a point where parents are starting to not be able to give their child in order in order to teach your child nowadays it's like they have to deliberately withhold something mm. you have to insert pain mm. so it goes against the mommy daddy button yeah nowhere before in history grandparents can't understand older generations can't understand because it used to be like this we're a farming society a hundred years ago yeah corn takes five months to grow you yeah. get your behind out here, you work. When yeah. you're not working, go get lost in the river somewhere, come back before the, you know, the light turns on, yeah. okay? Yeah. And you made it work. Parents didn't feel bad because corn, the bread, the cornbread wasn't ready in five minutes. That's right, that's right. Parents didn't feel like bad parents, like they were bad providers right. because they couldn't give the, the cornbread in five minutes. Right. Now, fast forward to today. We get food in 30 seconds or less. There it is, yeah. So now mm -hmm. for children to learn patience, to wait their turn, to learn how to share. Mm. All this thing is immediate. So if you want to teach those lessons now, we have to go against our own formula as parents. Yeah. We have to deliberately withhold something which right. causes them pain. And it's like, wait a second, my job is to provide, to give you better than what I had for myself. Right. Now their job is always, I want what I want and I want it now. That's it. Parents are not equipped today to deal with that. Right. And that's what I come in reverse. I take the little kids out of the driver's seat. I want what I want and I want it now. I put the parent back in the driver's seat. It's a little uncomfortable in the beginning, but once everything's back, the kid's like, yeah, this is kind of how it's supposed to be. I get this. And the parent's like, whoo, this is what I was looking for my whole life. <laughs> wow. Wow. Come on now. Come right, on now. Right. Maybe, I'm preaching. Maybe, I, maybe I was wrong earlier. Maybe I am preaching. <laughs> parents, parents, now listen, listen, listen. This is what we'll be talking about. This is some really, really valuable information. Everybody that's listening to this right now on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, Anchor. If you guys listen to this, make sure you like, subscribe, comment below. If you're on YouTube, make sure you hit that bell. Give me a thumbs up as it boosts us up to the recommended. Share this with your mama, your daddy, your uncle, your auntie, your grandma, your grandpa, your stepsister, your stepdaughter, your stepdog, your stepcat, your step aunt. I don't care who it is. Make sure you share it with somebody. Share it with Jim from across the street. I don't care who it is. Make sure you share with somebody because somebody needs to be hearing this right now because somebody out there is going through it with their child and you don't know how to get through. Hit my man, Jason Johnson up. 
in-home parent coach. He will help you. He will get you through. All right, so Jason, I want to I want to do something here. I want to uh, shift gears a little bit, right? Absolutely. You started you started a um, an organization called Fathers Leading Families, right? Yes, and sir. You, you mentioned earlier that you have a daughter of your own. She's two years old, Miss Princess Jasmine. Beautiful, beautiful little girl. Thank you. Thank you. Know, you. So what was the inspiration behind, you know, Fathers Leading Families? Sure. Ironically, um, my thought of Fathers Leading Families predated the birth of my child. Mm. Um, I spent almost, let's just, to make it sound round numbers, about a decade of my life raising um, other children. Right. Um, and, and not to put too much of their business out there, um, they had, the, the kids in particular had a lot of behavioral problems. And I helped kind of turn that around. Right. Um, loved the boys. The boys were, were amazing. Um, and for, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Um, so I have always been on this mission to help serve parents and teach them leadership skills. Mm -hmm. So I, what, I, what I noticed was that the way moms, moms give certain gifts to children that dads don't give. Mm -hmm. Dads give certain gifts to, to children that moms don't give mm -hmm. to give to get the whole child. Yeah. So what happens is you have mothers and fathers say, well, my gift is more special, important than your gift. No, well, my gift is more special, important than your gift. When actually the child can't decide. Mm -hmm. They have loyalty to both. So mm -hmm. while I was doing my in-home parent coaching program and I was teaching leadership, I realized that I was teaching the fathers and the men a slightly modified version of leadership. Right. Um, there's only so much that, that – because women are looking for the man to lead the, the, the family. Maybe not every interaction and every home front problem, but the general yeah. movement right. of the family is looked on to the father if he's present. Right. That's, right. His, that's one of his roles, right. one of the major roles. Right. So – as I'm adopting different ways, you know, I'm, I'm talking to women, to the mothers, I'm sharing, the, well, one, first, I'm requiring the fathers to be there. A lot right. of times in our field, for whatever reason, fathers might be at work, fathers might not be there, but whenever there was a two-parent home, I made sure dads had to be there. I would go there like, oh, you, you work till six o'clock? Okay, cool, I'll come at 7.30. Right. Like, there was never a scheduling problem. Oh, you can't do this day? Oh, I got, I got Saturdays at 10 o'clock available. Because I required, if the father was there, both parents are required. Makes sense. So I never had the experience of difficult parents. Right. I don't have that problem. I don't go to home like, oh, man, these parents are off the wall. No, they're just, if people knew better, they do better. It's that simple. Right. Basically. I help them I help them know more, and they kill it. That's yeah. it. So I, so I know that. Fathers need a slightly modified version. Yeah. And in my field, maybe like 2017, there was this big kick across the state. They finally figured out that they don't know how to engage fathers in treatment. Mm. They, they're racking their brains like, we, you know, fathers are actually really important. And Very, if there's yeah. a, if there's a oh, way no. that we can somehow include them. Hey, this like, for dads. It's a long, this one for the dads. I mean, I mean, it's a long shot if we can get them to want to be there. Right. <laughs> right. This well, is the attitude about fathers. Right. On, <laughs> That's what so, the fathers right there. And so, and so, wait, so right there, right there, if they want to be there, right? And just today, right before we got on, right, they're – there is a comment on my on my Instagram. You get a chance to check it out. That a mother who has um, a daughter who has Down syndrome. The daughter is is three months old, and the father actually was not a, accepting to his daughter. You know, uh, having a special need, pretty much, right? And there are many, you know, men that are like that. In and I, I take you know, offense to men that are like that towards, you know, especially ch any child, you know, period, that if you're not taking care of the child, but to sit here and, and use hurtful words towards your child who is three months old, 
calling, you know, basically called a child a monkey and all this other stuff, like very ignorant words to say. And I take even extra offense, you know, at the fact that, you know, dude, this is your child and she has special needs and she, you know, she has Down syndrome and she's a beautiful little girl, mind you, right? Mm -hmm. So there are fathers out there now that are, you know, they're just pretty much, let's just call it what it is. They're out here pissing in the wind. And they're just going off, doing whatever they want to do. Maybe they're not banging with their baby mom like that. I don't even like using the term baby mom or whatever. The mother of your child, you're not banging with them like that. You want to do what you want to do. You want to go where you want to go. You you want to sit there and stick and move. Pretty much that's what you want to do, right? And then you have the 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 from the special needs standpoint where you want to deny your child, which is even far worse, you know, to me because, you know, I, I'm – you know, I'm sensitive to that because I have a special needs son and like it would, I couldn't even imagine just not being there for any of my children. This guy sat here and created fake pages to talk about his own child, Oh wow! which is ridiculous, which therefore this person, you know, makes, you know, other fathers look bad in a sense. Well, you know what? I ain't going to speak. I ain't going to say that. He make himself look horrible because mm-hmm. it's just like, dude, why, why even do that? Where do you feel that, you know, men get this, this idea that it's okay to pretty much disown their children um, and even take it even further to make fake pages and things of that nature about them? Now, I don't know the details of the, of the relationship, but regardless of the fact, I've heard this story enough times in my DM where there are always there's there's a there's a man who doesn't want to be in the child's life so they say cruel things like i don't make children like that or that's not my child because they may they may be ashamed because their child is different now is it now my question to you as the professional do you think it's a psychological issue where they are embarrassed or um they, they're like ashamed to have their child be, you know, different or be some somewhat of a minority when they go to school and, you know what I'm saying? Like, are, you, in your professional opinion, what do you, what do you think the issue is there? So again, remember I told you two different hats. There's the parent coach and then there's the therapy hat. So um, it sounded more therapy based, which is cool. Um, I guess in, in general, generally speaking from a, if I'm wearing my, therapist hat remember you're you're broken you were living your life something happened you got depression you broke a bone you have a child that has down syndrome you you have this disorder i'm not saying that the that the child's birth caused the disorder but i'm saying you're coming from the medical model it's a broken model you're living your life and then something broke and then you have to try to fix it just to bring it back to zero there's, there's a lot of grim there's not a lot of great answers, but the best answer from that model is some people experience what is called the loss of the ideal baby. Mm. Especially a lot of times with, with, when parents have children with, um, but things go wrong physically, um, sometimes even emotionally. What happens is there is a grieving that happens and everybody grieves differently because before you have the baby, you have all these wishes and dreams and fantasies of how it's gonna be, what it's gonna look like, how I'm gonna connect with my spouse, what I'm gonna do with my child, how we're gonna be as a family. And then all those things don't come into fruition. And for some people, it leads them on the path of destruction and makes them do things that don't make sense. Wow. wow. So this, so this is talking like about the, the really loss of the ideal baby. So the loss of the ideal baby. So basically what he's saying. Even the people who stick around and help and are involved still struggle with the loss of the ideal baby. Right. So they, so basically your, your depiction or your, your vision of what you want your child to look like, you know, when, when he or she come is born and that that's, that just doesn't happen that way. That's not what God has for you. You then go on a path of destruction because you didn't get what you want. Right. So, isn't that kind of like a, a childish mentality as well, too? Absolutely. You, you know what I'm saying? Where a, a no. person, you, you no. know, a child doesn't get what they want. They want to th- sit there and throw a temper tantrum. 
But here's what's fascinating. I love the parent coach angle because from the now put on a taking away that like which is there's realness to the loss of the ideal baby. That doesn't give you a license to be a effed up person. We're, switch, we're switching heads here, guys. We're switching heads. Go ahead. Now I'm taking that therapy hat off, loss of ideal baby. Now we're putting on my cape. We're okay. putting on the in-home parent coach. Yeah. So how it relates to fathers leading families is this. I tell people, if you take a plant, what, like if you had a favorite, what's your wife's favorite flower? Uh, roses. Sorry. <laughs> Roses, of course, duh. Yeah. So if you take some roses and you put it in some sunlight, you have good soil, and 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 and, uh, and you water the plant, what happens? It grows. It grows. It, flush, it yeah. flourishes, right? Right. If you take weeds and you put them in good soil, sunlight, and water, what happens? Uh, the weeds grow? I'm yeah. Not, not a green, green No, you're right. Okay. Here's yeah. the thing. As long as a plant gets the adequate sunlight, and I use this as a metaphor, sunlight, uh, water, and good soil, they're going to grow. It doesn't care that the rose is like, I'm pretty, and women like me, mm. and the weeds destroy your garden. Mm. It doesn't matter. So as a parent coach, what I tell people to do is to focus on flowers, not weeds. Wow. We don't water weeds. Right. We water flowers. Right. So- your question from the parent coach, the fathers leading families, which is spin off of the parent coach perspective, is like, yeah, there's a lot of weeds out there. I'm not putting any sunlight. I'm not watering it. It's not for them. Mm. This is for fathers who are there, who want to be there, exactly. who are just like, give me some direction and I got you. Yeah. They're, just, they're not given the opportunity yeah. because here's something I want to tell you about fathers. It's very fascinating. Here's... Here's the main issue. The problem is at what point men are supposed to be in the lot, supposed to be traditionally involved in a child's life. And here's, here's a great example. Let me just talk about school, okay? How old were you when you first noticed a male teacher that was not a gym teacher in your school career? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. That yeah. puts you at 13 or 14. You're a teenager. Yeah. See, guys could be gym teachers for a third grader. Yeah. Guys can teach gym in kindergarten. Right. But here's the narrative, whether we're black, white, Spanish, whatever we are. The narrative, the narrative for men is if you're under 12, you're not supposed to be there. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Mm. I was counseling young kids. Right. For, for, for years mm -hmm. and colleagues would be like, what, what's wrong with you that you want to work with such young kids? Well, let's say I lost my childhood and I was a, a parentified child and I just love the wonder and joy and amazement that kids have. It doesn't make me a pedophile. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know right. What I'm saying? And I'm good at it. Right. And <laughs> I, agree, I agree with you. I agree with you because for me, as, as, as a dancer, uh, one of my first jobs was, you know, at one of my first dancing jobs was at the YMCA. And not only was, you know, was I teaching there as a dancer, but before I even started teaching there, I was in the morning and after school programs. And I was a counselor, you know, for a number of years. And I, I was with the second graders, the third graders, the first graders, and working with them. And I, so I understand, you know, but I just, you know, I just adapted you know, to children, they adapted to me because I was fun. You know, they like to, we play football, we play basketball. Mm -hmm. When they had issues, like I understood where they were coming from. Then I translate that into, oh, snap, Mr. Kenny, he's a dancer. So I started using that gift to get them, you know, to learn how to dance. Men give different. But, yeah, the but let me, let me say, but let me, but let me say this real quick. Okay. So, sure. so Jason, he, he took on this, he put on his therapy hat. Then he put on his, his parent coach hat. I want to put on, you know, the the straight up hat. Like, I just, <laughs> I'm gonna, the, straight, the straight up hat is this, yo. Real rap, bruh. Whoever, you know, these men are. Listen, if you are a man and you have a child, stop playing with your life and take care of yours. Period. Ain't no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you lay down, then put it down. You know what I'm saying? Go in and do what you got to do. 
I, 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 you don't understand how many women, you know, hit my, hit my, uh, my, my, my DM and like my, 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 my husband or my boyfriend or my father's child or whatever, they left me because of blah, blah, blah. And all of this, like this happens a lot. This happens a lot. And my wife will sit there and show you like, this is not a game. This is a problem. And you have a problem. And I'm saying that with love. I'm not coming at you. And I don't know your, your personal business. I don't know the ins and outs. All I know is that there's a child out there that doesn't have their father. And if you are, a, are alive today, right now, and you're able to be there, be there. I don't care if you're white, black, Spanish, whatever. It doesn't matter. You could be Russian. You could be freaking Polish for all I don't care. Be there. For your child. Over the past three yeah. years or so, there's been a lot of male movements. Right. It's because there's not, there's not a lot of support for fathers who want to be there. Right. And everybody who's typecasted is not caring or right. doesn't want to be involved. Be here. But, this, be here. but this, this, is the, this is the aha moment. I'm going to say it again for effect. Many relationships right. have, have a point where they can't stay together. Because the overall narrative right. that men get is if we didn't need you, we don't want, like, we don't want you here. We got this. Mm. And that's, I'm not being disrespectful to mothers because I teach, I, women lead in different ways than men lead and, and children need both. Mm. I'll give you an example. Like, um, so women give children free spirit. Free spirit is not a characteristic that fathers give. So wh where is this illustrated free spirit? So you go to McDonald's or when you could go back to Burger King or McDonald's and you're, you're, you're going with your kids. The kids are so excited. They run up. They try to get the crown from the Burger King and they're cutting in front of people and they're not saying, excuse me. And the dad's sitting there like, this is chaos. What are you doing? Because dads teach order, structure. Um, consideration because we're more we we are better with aerial spatial cues that's why we don't get lost with directions all the time there's just certain characteristics like men can't knit as good as women can because they have better fine motor skills right. so this idea of free spirit the mom is not actually allowing their kids to go crazy the gift that the mother is giving to that moment is that as long as you're not hurting anybody or you're not you know, too overly wild, be you, express yourself. That is a beautiful gift to give to your child. Now, what happens is to the couple, because remember, there's a lot of divorces out there. Yeah, and part of the reason this happens here in America, man, it's crazy. Is because men are told the younger they are, the less you get a say in. Mm -hmm. The younger you are. When they're, if they're boys and they're older, okay, cool. But you, 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 you lay down the law, you give the discipline, and then go away. And it's not on purpose. It's not something women do on purpose to deliberately make guys go away. What I'm saying is that the sexes are not familiar with the complementary gifts. So instead of turning towards each other, they turn away from each other. Mm -hmm. And so I give you that example again where the man is like, our kid needs to be back here. It looks yeah. like we have no control over our child. Right. But to the woman, it's like you're messing with their free spirit. Men don't give children free spirit. Women do. And that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So even with Papa was a Rolling Stone, he's, he has, he's there to give structure, discipline, yeah. rules. Yep. That's, that, that's the division of labor. So what's my point? My point is how fathers leading families came into being was they were claiming that we want to reach fathers more. Mm -hmm. And the reality was they weren't. They were feeding me a story. They were just telling me for a year and a half, we, we want your parenting program. We want your father's program. But what we want you to really do first is get trained in a batterer's program. Right. We want you to basically forget prevention. We want to wait to the, excuse my language, but the real bad fathers who beat their wives yeah. are now caught and they're now required to go to a program as a state. We value those programs because nobody wants to do that. Right. Instead of getting fathers together while they're with their families, right. while they want to be involved, right. and while yeah. they're there, right. let's focus on the batterers program.
So it basically it discussed, I was like, you know what? I know it's hard to get guys into this idea of therapy and mental health. We don't want to talk about our feelings. We don't. That's fine. So I knew Fathers Dating Families was not going to initiate as one big men therapy group. Right, right. I'll right. get nobody in the door. Right. But Fathers Dating Families with a, a mission to serve fathers and part of it, you know, there's cool merch, there's hats, there's hoodies, there's also what I call fatherhood fraternity meetings. There's masks. <laughs> there's masks. It's, it's yeah. a whole apparel line because yeah. that gets their attention. That's dope. But what I'm really doing is create, I created an organization that focuses on fathers because there's four different types of fathers and they all need different direction. There's married fathers, mm-hmm. there's single fathers, there's stepfathers like in blended families, adoptive fathers, and actually there's five grandfathers. Yeah, true. So we can't all be, it, it, the, the, the support that married fathers need is different from the, the support right. that singles dads yeah. need. So my goal, I, Fathers Eating Families, was to bring them all in under one roof and celebrate us all. Mm. There's no value. There's no celebration. Right. So I'm, I'm the simplest thing on the planet. We're celebrating and we're valuing fathers. The ones that want to be involved with their children, we're watering the rose yeah. and the weeds we are disregarding. Right, right. The, the have and the have nots, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? So pa- fathers, if y'all want to be involved, Y'all know where to go. Y'all make sure y'all hit my man up, Fathers Eating Family, on Instagram. You know what I'm saying? For those that don't want to be there, you know what I'm saying? Listen, man, go ahead and keep moving in. You know what I mean? Because then, you know what? Another man is going to end up taking your spot. And if you cool with that, then you cool with that. You know what I'm saying? If you cool with another man raising your seed, then be cool with that. Now, Jason, I'm going to ask you this question, man. Now, dealing with this, this pandemic the social injustice that we've been dealing with, you know what I'm saying? Everything is is going crazy, right? You know, and the first half of the year has been has been pretty wild. The first half of the year, 2020, has been pretty wild. People have been saying, you know, it's supposed to be the year of vision and stuff like that. And I believe it is the year of vision. I believe that this is the year that people are seeing it. I believe that this is the year that people are actually seeing real truth. You know what I'm saying? They're seeing who their real friends are. They're seeing where they're going to be at. They're seeing what type of success that they have, what type of success that they don't have. They're seeing what they weren't supposed to be doing. They're seeing the type of corrupt type of world that we live in. They're seeing so much. This is the year of vision. Let's not get it twisted, I right? I people, people think that, you know, oh, this is the year of vision and, and, and all, it's only going to be about success. Mm. But vision is exactly what it is. You're going to see everything, right? That just doesn't mean, you know, uh, all the good things. You're going to see all all the bad things as well, too. And and in my personal opinion, I'm pretty glad that we've seen all the bad things in the early half of the year. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer that in the second half of the year, that things are going to end up changing. Things are going to end up being, you know, a lot greater than the first half of the year. So here's my question to you, right? You being, and if, if you hear Christian, guys, don't don't mind. He's supposed to be asleep right now. It's almost 11 o'clock at night. We, we got a little bit of time left, but I'm going to ask Jason this last question here, right? If you had the opportunity to speak to all the parents in the world, any person that has a child and all the fathers in the world as well too, gearing them up for the second half of the year, what type of encouraging words would you say to them to get ready? I would say look inward. Um, Ooh. I don't expect Ooh. that. Um, yeah. That's where it all goes down. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Come, yo, we on the same wave because I was just talking about that today. Go ahead. So, again, I'm totally sound this out, totally impromptu. But, you know, we, 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 we look so much outside of ourselves. And, yeah. and, and, and I think what this has forced everybody to do is sit down and look inward and, and – what do you want with your life? You know, it's asking you the best question. Like, it's a beautiful time because it's basically saying, what story do you want to write moving forward? So, you know, it's a very big opportunity. It's, it, it can be viewed as scary. You know, we don't know officially if schools are open. We don't know officially if the pandemic's going to come back. 
Uh, we don't know if the protests had anything to do with helping the pandemic or hurting the pandemic. There's a lot of unknowns. And, you know, I, I guess this kind of goes back to, I've had this lesson a long, long time ago. I'm not in a rush to my casket. And people say life is, uh, um, is short. Yeah. Let me tell you, my, my parents have been gone almost 33 years this year. Wow. It's long. It's, it's long. a long time, you know. And what you do with that time, you can make it the way you want it to be. But if you don't, if you don't ask yourself what you want to see, if you don't do what lights you up, if you don't go after your vision, you're going to fall into other people's agendas. You're going to live out other people's dreams. You're going you're gonna to be forced to do things that, you know, are kind of cool, but might, maybe not what you want to be known for moving forward. So I think... I definitely don't know where we're going. But what I will say is that if we ask ourselves these tough questions is the first step. You know, where do I see myself going? What do I want to do with myself? You know, not like you have to have this grand light bulb moment, but just take one foot and put it in front of the other. You know, I'm watching you teach Christian how to walk who's doing an amazing job. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's yeah. one foot in front of the other and you're going to fall, get back up, go again. There it is. Do it again and again. So we're at this time where we're going to have to take baby steps. Yeah. We are. Yeah. And we're going to all learn together. We're going to look back and, and figure out what it was because nobody knows the answer. There it but is. I, I would say that, you know, whatever you believe in or subscribe to, that's also going to be a helpful yeah. um, piece to this puzzle. You know, faith, whatever, you know, Fathers leading families and the way I teach is non-denominational. Uh, what I do know is that you got to um, b believe in something bigger than yourself yeah. to make it through times like this, right. whatever that is. Because you were created, so therefore you got to create or at the end of the day, whether you want to agree or disagree, whatever the case may be. You know what I'm saying? I, I agree with you, brother. Like, we got to look inward. And I was just speaking about that today. You know, too many times we look, you know, from the outside and we need to start looking from the inside going out you know so check this out guys i need you guys to make sure that you like subscribe comment below this is my man jason johnson the in-home parent coach and the man who has started fathers leading families now jason before we get out of here okay we're gonna play a little game cool, cool. ready okay. all right cool so we're gonna play a game the game is called in the clutch i'm kenny clutch and this is in the clutch okay so uh, I started a, a company in 2009 called um, In The Clutch, and it's an acronym um, that, that stands for I-N-D-A-C-L-U-T-C-H, Inspirational Dancers Creatively Linking Upon the Culture of Hip Hop. Got it? Got it. So I'm going to give you a letter, and then you give me a positive word that goes with that letter. Cool? Okay. All right. Absolutely. All right, here we go. C. Charm. Mm -hmm. L. Love. Everybody says love. You. <laughs> Useful. Okay. T. Thankful. Mm. C again. Courageous. H. Happy. All right, all right. There all it right. is. That's clutch, y'all. That's clutch. That's clutch. That's clutch. That's clutch. Listen, Jason, where can the people find you at? Go ahead and shout out your Instagram and shout out your website. Absolutely. So on Instagram, it's at fathers underscore leading underscore families is the Instagram. Uh, it's www.fathersleadingfamilies.com for all the fatherhood programs. Uh, for po uh, parent coaching, in-home therapy. Uh, we also do online therapy because given the, the COVID, you know, we can't go to people's homes, but we do on online work or we work remotely. Um, it's theinhomeparentcoach.com, www.theinhomeparentcoach.com. And um, listen, I'm all about the family. If you haven't noticed, you know, it's, it's about service to the family. There That's my is. client. There it is. There it is, guys. So listen, make sure you go ahead and like, subscribe, comment below. Click that bell if you are watching this on YouTube. Go ahead and, and share this up and, and 
you know, go ahead, give me a thumbs up as it bumps it up to a recommended, guys, okay? So make sure you share with your mama, your daddy, your uncle, your auntie, your grandma, your grandpa, your granddad, your stepsister, your stepdaughter, your stepcat, your stepdog, your step tarantula. I don't care who it is. You can share it with your king cobra for all I care, but make sure you share it with somebody that needs to hear this message. Give it to the queen of England. Give it to the president of the United States. I do not care, but somebody needs to hear these messages that we are putting out all throughout 2020, the most positive podcast in the world today. It is the Clutch Vision Podcast. And like I say all the time, when we change the mind, we change the game. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow we'll worry about itself. And today is all we have. And if today is all you have, make sure you impact today the best way that you know how on a positive note, not a negative note. It's your boy, Kenny Clutch on the Clutch Vision Podcast. I'll see y'all next time. Peace. Yeah.